Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for today's uh, special Lunch and Learn webinar, Health Promotion in Community Primary Care. Um, sorry, Health Promotion in Community Primary Health Care. Um, we uh, have a great group of speakers for you today. I'm very excited about this. I'm very happy uh, to have so many of you people, uh, so many people here. Um, and I would just like to uh, start with a bit of a welcome, um, an introduction, some housekeeping, and uh, a land acknowledgement uh, before uh, we bring the speakers on and uh, let them share their exciting work with you. So our panelists and presenters today are uh, Natasha, a health promoter from Centertown CHC, Hillary, also a health promoter from Carlington CHC, Susan, a health promoter from Pinecrest Queensway CHC, Linda, a community health worker at Seaway Valley CHC, Jacob, a youth team lead at Wabano, um, at, actually, I believe it's Wabano Center for Aboriginal Health. So, my apologies for the typo there. And Cameron, uh, who is executive director at Carlington CHC. A quick little bit of housekeeping, um, just uh, to let you know you've all been, you're all muted when you came into the uh, webinar, and we ask you to remain muted during the presentation. Uh, we will uh, we do have a chat uh, function, uh, so you can use that to chat with other participants or to ask questions. Um, I, I see here that there's some old information. Unfortunately, we do not have sign language interpretation. Uh, for this webinar, uh, but please do use the chat window to ask your questions and um, during the Q&A period towards the end, we will bring all of those questions to our uh, presenters. Now, uh, I want to start us off in a good way with an acknowledgement of our presence on Indigenous territory. The work of the Alliance and our members takes place on traditional territories of Indigenous nations who have lived here and cared for these lands since time immemorial. The land that we call Ontario is covered by 46 treaties, agreements and land purchases, as well as unceded territories. The Alliance offices and the home office where I am working are located in Toronto on lands that are the traditional homes of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. This is Dish with One Spoon Treaty Territory. The Dish with One Spoon is an ancient law. It's been used by Indigenous peoples of the Americas for at least 900 years, and it signifies that everyone who shares the land is expected to limit what they take from it in order to leave enough for others and in order to ensure that the lands remain vibrant and viable for future generations. So I think it's important that we consider uh, the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and its implications for us in all of our work and our activities in these lands. Canada continues to be home to many Indigenous people who've lived here alongside settlers, newcomers, and people whose ancestors were enslaved across the Americas and the Caribbean. As a settler here, I am grateful to live and work on this land and I acknowledge the impact my existence here has on the many Indigenous nations for whom this is home. For all of us to recognize this in a meaningful way means we make commitments to sharing and upholding our responsibilities to everyone who now lives on these lands, to the future generations, and to the land and resources that make our lives possible. It also means we consider the impacts of our presence, our words, and our actions on the Indigenous people who were here first. So in our work and all of our activities, let us be mindful of these commitments. Let us be vigilant of our words and actions, including the ones left unsaid and undone. And let us choose those words and actions wisely. Um, and just before I turn you over to uh, Natasha, who will be um, presenting an introduction to health promotion and to the work of Hypnio. Um, I think I've already done this. I'm sorry. This is a, a rough start for me this morning. My apologies. I'm going to turn you over to Natasha immediately. Thanks, everybody, for your patience and for joining us today. 
Good morning. I'm zooming in from Ottawa, the unceded territory of the Algonquin. And I'll just introduce myself really briefly. So as Catherine mentioned, I'm a health promoter. I work in stress reduction, smoking cessation, physical activity, and social prescribing at Centertown <laughs> Community Health Center, uh, which is a beautiful downtown Ottawa, a downtown bilingual center. We work with um, seniors, LGBT populations, newcomers, families, people living with mental health and addictions, and people living in poverty. And so today, what we're what we're what we've got set up for you today, this is a presentation that was originally um, given back in June, and it was put on by the Health Promotion Network of Eastern Ontario, HIPNEO, as we like to call it. And uh, we thought it would be great to share it with a wider audience because we we put a lot of work into it. And basically, the overview is uh, we're just going to do a quick introduction to health promotion and to the HIPNEO. Um, just for those who might be new to some of those concepts or as a refresher for some uh, folks who've been working in um, the field for a long, longer time. And we wanted to share some ways that health promoters have been working during the pandemic, how we've supported pandemic response, how we've continued on with our regular health promotion, and also how we have responded to the shadow pandemic, some of the other issues that were brought about by some of the conditions that were in place. Um, so I think we were going to start with a little survey uh, just to see who's in our Zoom room with us today. Um, so I'm going to, oh, here we go. So here's your first question. I think everyone can see it. So where are you joining us from today? So I guess I can't, organizers can't vote, but so just take a few minutes and let us know where you're Zooming in from. Hey, I'm seeing some Eastern Ontario coming in, Central, little representation from the North. Oh, I love watching these responses come in. Oh, and you know, we should have a, I wonder if there's an other for people, there might be people joining us from places outside of Ontario. We do have an option for outside of Ontario. Oh, okay, great. And uh, Natasha, just to let you know, all three of those intro questions are showing for the audience at the same uh, time. Okay, okay. So where are you coming from? And what field are you in? And how, I think the third one was, um, how long have you been working? In uh, how familiar are you with health promotion? Uh -huh. Great, yeah. thanks Catherine. I think you can scroll down if you look at the, where you can see the answers coming in. I think you can scroll up and down in there. And every time I'm learning more, I'm going deeper and deeper into Zoom every time. Oh, this is so interesting to see the answers coming in. So nobody so far has answered that they've never heard of health promotion before. That's great. You're in the right place. We'll just give it, I guess we'll give it a few more seconds. You should all be seeing the results up on your screens now. So am I seeing what everyone's seeing, Catherine? So. I think they're seeing it prettier than you and I are seeing it. But okay. you're seeing the same information. We're in the behind the scenes. Uh, so yeah, so 16% joining us from Southwest Ontario, 4% from uh, Northern Ontario, 39% from the East, woo, woo, where I'm zooming in from, 14% uh, from Central West, 6% from Central East, and 14% from Toronto, and 6% from outside of Ontario. So welcome, everyone. And then 43% of people um, 
are in a role of health promoter, community development worker. 22% are managers, 8% executive leaders or board members, 8% um, are clinicians or other interprofessional healthcare providers, 4% are administrative, IT or data management, 2% are policymakers, uh, some students and researchers in the house, uh, one person who identif uh, identifies as a client and one person who identifies as other. Great. And then when we get to the question about how familiar are you with health promotion, so a lot of expertise in the room and uh, people who have some expertise but are, are open to learning some more. But no one is here who's never heard of health promotion before. So excellent. Awesome. Okay. So from there, I think I'll shift right into my presentation on health promotion. So yeah, so I'm the co-chair of HIPNEO and I think we have about 18 individual um, members. So um, I know I'll probably miss someone, but uh, we're, our membership is made up of Gateway, Kingston, Seaway Valley, Santa Santé de l'Esprit, Belleville Quinty, Wabano, Somerset West, Sandy Hill, Centertown, Southeast Ottawa, Carlington, Pinecrest, Queensway, North Lanark, South Nepean, Rideau, Whitewater Bromley, Country Road, uh, among others, in case I've missed anyone. And we're a group of Eastern Ontario health promoters who come together uh, quarterly and we um, basically focus on strategically embedding health promotion within the community health center model of health and well-being. Uh, we're collaborative, integrated, and very upstream focused. And I also just have to take a moment to give a shout out to Susan Karu Vila, who was supposed to give this presentation. Uh, she's the health promoter at South Nepean Satellite. And because she is busy promoting and working three pop-up vaccine clinics this week, um, I stepped in to cover the presentation. So shout out to Susan. She's working hard. And that's like a real life example of how health promoters are stepping in uh, to support the work. And context for HIPNEO, uh, we focus on specific initiatives related to advancing health promotion work in Eastern Ontario. We're aligned with the Alliance for Healthier Communities. We support the goals of the Ontario health teams. Um, that context is evolving. Um, we do strategic planning and our areas of strategic focus are increasing the understanding of the importance and the role of health promotion, integrating HIPNEO into the broader context of health promotion and maintaining a strong action oriented network. So we do collaborate with the Alliance for Healthier Communities. We've organized regional gatherings for professional development um, in every kind of every second year. We've worked with the Alliance for things like improving the community initiative resource tool, improving how we uh, encounter personal development groups. We've worked with them for the Be Well survey, vital aid indicators, how to develop health promotion indicators and CSP. And we also have orientation materials. For example, this PowerPoint is available for new staff in the health promotion field or for new board members as a way of giving an orientation. And it's also uh, provided for HIPNEO members as an orientation tool. Um, so yes, so one of the ways health promoters have been working is as part of the pandemic response. So communicating, changing public health agendas, um, strengthening social networks, mobilizing the community, demonstrating innovative and innovation and creativity while using evidence-based best practices, uh, maintaining all of our non-COVID related health promotion work for continued health in the community. Many of the populations we work with are vulnerable and we're losing a lot of their services. So we kept our work going, um, engaging the community in the pandemic response process and responding to the shadow pandemic. So those things like the poison drug supply, uh, domestic violence, like all of those issues that also were highlighted during the pandemic. And this comes from the Health Promotion Ontario um, conference that took place about a year ago. And then I'll just review, most of you already know this, but just some of the core concepts of health promotion, we'll just go over it really briefly. It's just a good refresher. Um, so as I think most people know, the first international conference on health promotion was held in Ottawa in 1986. And this charter is kind of, um, what um, is kind of the birthplace of some of this work. So the, promote, the process of enabling people to increase control over and to improve their health and really a more 
broad definition of health. And then I have a, I think I have an image of the Ottawa Charter. So the name of the international agreement signed the first international conference on health promotion organized by the World Health Organization. And it launched a series of actions among international organizations, national governments, and local communities to achieve the goal of health for all by the year 2000 and beyond through better health promotion. So another guiding principle that we work with is health equity. So that means that all people can reach their full health potential and should not be disadvantaged from attaining it because of race, ethnicity, religion, gender, age, age social class, socioeconomic status, or other socially determined circumstances. And it's really the commitment to ensure equal access to health and health services. And inequity would be defined as, you know, those social determinants of health, those interrelated social and economic factors that influence the health of a population. So variations in health outcomes are rooted in unequal social relations, such as gender inequity, racism, exclusion, social and economic exclusion. And these things are systematic, avoidable, unfair, and unjust. And then I like to show this image of the health gradient. So the ball is either rolling slightly downhill or being pushed up the hill based on these conditions and how many barriers um, an individual might face. So this can help us move away from that model of individual blame towards a greater understanding about how our health and well being is influenced strongly uh, by the conditions around us. Um, Ontario's experience during the pandemic exposed some of those vulnerabilities and some of the strategies implemented. Um, you know, responded appropriately, such as targeting vulnerable neighborhoods, um, you know, the, the petition for, for paid sick leave and, and such. So, so determinants of health can have both um, additive and interactive effects. So just a little illustration. And then I also wanted to just uh, mention the Alliance for Healthier Communities Health Equity Charter. So this is built on the recognition that historical and current systems of power rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism have created conditions where certain populations have been treated as expendable, are marginalized and excluded from decision-making and have inadequate access to resources in our society. So the results of these inequities and marginalizations are health disparities experienced by many groups across Ontario. Um, well, often seen as inherent poor health outcomes are in fact caused by health inequities that are avoidable, discriminatory, and unjust. And just some of the beliefs and principles of the health equity charter. So we use a social justice, human rights approach, indigenous health and indigenous hands, reconciliation, allyship, relationship, integrity and cultural community, humility, distribution of power, shared responsibility, and broader concepts of health. And I'll just share the, um, our model of health and well-being, which, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. And the Aboriginal Health Access Center model of holistic health and well-being. And then I just have a few quick resources to share. Um, so, information from the World Health Organization and Public Health Ontario, um, as well as the Canadian Index of Wellbeing. So these are some great links and we can send them out afterwards. I won't, I won't go into them too far, too, too deeply. And the Canadian Index of Wellbeing is just a tool that was created to look at, instead of just looking at our gross national product to see how well are people doing, is there some wellness indicators that we can use to measure the, the well-being and health of our communities? Um, so there's eight domains and each one has eight indicators. And then just to some information on the social determinants of health. So the primary factors that shape the health of Canadians are not necessarily medical treatments or lifestyle choices, but rather the living conditions they're experiencing. And these are known as the social determinants of health. So including income and income distribution, education, unemployment, job security, um, early childhood development, food insecurity, housing, social exclusion, social safety net, health services, geography, disability, being indigenous, gender, immigration, race, and globalization. And then I also just wanted to draw attention to the 
health equity charter from the Alliance for Healthier Communities, which was just updated this year and is very, very comprehensive. And it's basically, I'm just going to be repeating some things I said earlier, but it's built on a recognition that historical and current systems of power rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism have created conditions where certain populations have been treated as expendable and are marginalized. So I've kind of already covered that, but that's a great resource to uh, really help um, cement our work. And Better Life Index, these are some other um, just great resources to help guide health promotion work. And I think my last resource is the Community Development Handbook, which is used by our um, community developers in our Eastern Ontario. And oh, I guess I have a couple more. So the Pan Canadian Network for Health Promoter Competencies and the Foundations course uh, through Public Health Ontario is a great uh, starting point for those who are new to the field. So that's just my quick little uh, overview, a little introduction to health promotion and to HIPMEO. And from here, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Jacob from the Wabano Center for Aboriginal Health. And he's gonna lead us. So the other thing we planned for today is a couple of experiential um, experiences where you can sample some of the health promotion work we've been doing over the past year. So the first one will be with Jacob. So I'll pass the mic over. So just before I start, everyone, um, I actually need to, sh uh, the screen is still being shared. If it's possible, I can share my audio. I tried to share the audio. Quick emails here and saying that. Uh... Possible we can let me uh, share the audio. All right, Jacob, you should be able to just take over the sharing because I've made you co-host. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm clicking, clicking yes here. Do you want to continue to share in my audio? And it says that because there's a, another screen being shared. So there we go. I should, this should work. Okay. We're good. All right. So, Ani, bonjour. Hello, everyone. I'd like to again acknowledge we are unceded Algonquin territory and also that every Indigenous child in this nation matters. My name is Jacob Taiforme. Today I represent Wabano Center for Aboriginal Health. I am the team lead for Indigenous Youth Services and the fitness instructor for our center that supports health and fitness programming to our Indigenous community members. I wanna say miigwech and thank you. I am grateful to have this time today in this space to lead a mindful exercise. One of my favorite mindfulness exercises I love to perform for our clients is a breathing exercise. Breathing exercises have long-term health benefits that can enhance the quality of our lives, especially during these tough times we are living in right now. Some of these benefits include reduce stress levels in our body, lower our heart rate, lower our blood pressure, improve symptoms of community members living with diabetes, reduces depression, better manage chronic pain, better regulate our body's reaction to stress and fatigue, reduce the possibility of burnout. And my favorite benefit is to bring attention to how our body is feeling in present time through the mind and body connection. So in this breathing exercise, we will perform today. It's easy, I promise. <laughs> I call this breathing exercise the 737. So starting when the depth within the depths of our diaphragm. So I'm just gonna pull the screen down our diaphragm is a strong muscle that actually separates our chest and our abdominals, and it sits right underneath our lungs. So we're going to start within the depths of our diaphragm. We start inhaling through our nose, filling up our lungs on a count of seven seconds, and then we'll be holding the oxygen in our lungs for three seconds. And then exhaling through our mouth, emptying our lungs for seven seconds. And that whole process is going to be called one cycle. So today, when we're performing, we're going to be doing seven cycles of this breathing exercise together. Now, when I, I'm going to demonstrate right now, so I'll do a quick demonstration. 
to start. And you're going to notice that I'm not going to be counting the seconds. I'm actually going to be counting in my mind, kind of more connecting with our lung and our breathing, connect that mind and body. Okay, so I'll start to show. I'm going to do one more. Amazing. I feel less stressed and nervous for this event. <laughs> All right. So um, that was two cycles that I did. And um, today what we're going to do um, we're all going to do this together. Um, I ask during this, uh, these seven cycles that I'm going to lead that your eyes are closed. So if everyone can please, I know I can't see everyone on the screen, but please in your comfortable position sitting, I would like everyone to close their eyes. Now, while your eyes are closed, I would like you to start these cycles of breath. So the best way also is to start first exhale, empty every part of the oxygen into your, out of your lungs and then start with the diaphragm and filling up. So closing our eyes, let's start inhaling. Holding for three, two, exhale. Now I want you to continue those cycles of breath. Now, so continuing this pattern and closing your eyes, I want you to think of a memory, a happy memory, a joyful experience, or a moment in your life in the past, whether it was with your family, friends, coworkers, or even just by yourself. And when you find that happy or joyful experience, memory or moment, I want you to hold on to that in your thoughts while you're breathing and connecting with your body. So once you find it, we're going to commence our seven cycles, okay? Three, two, one. Keeping your eyes closed and continuing those cycles of breath on your own and together in the circle. I'd like you to start creating some body awareness. Start wiggling your toes as you're breathing. Still continuing to breathe. Wiggle your toes. You can move your feet left and right. 
for your ankles. Next, you can move your legs and your hips. If you have a rotating chair, you can go side to side. Next, what we're gonna do is go with our shoulders. We're just gonna do light rotations going up and back as you're breathing. Nice posture, sitting straight up, bring those shoulders back. Next, we're gonna bring awareness to our neck. We're gonna just do slow side to side movements with our neck, side to side. Still breathing. Next, we can go up and down with our neck. Slow. Next, we can wiggle our fingers, hands, move our wrists. Closing our eyes, we're almost complete here. I want everyone to just give yourself a nice self hug. Nice self hug. Deep inhale. And exhale. All right. So you can slowly open up your eyes. If I still have you with me, that's amazing. <laughs> I want to say miigwech and thank you everyone for allowing me to open up today with a mindful exercise. I appreciate the time and space that we have sharing today. And I will now pass the baton to my colleagues. Hillary and Linda, and um, Miigwech, and thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Always my favorite part. <laughs> uh, so this next section, we will be uh, highlighting some submissions from various community health centers and resource centers to highlight some of um, our proudest moments, best practices, and impactful programs from this past year and a half. It's exciting to see uh, and celebrate and learn how the health promotion initiatives have creatively pivoted during the pandemic in order to provide safe and meaningful health and social well-being programs. Uh, while we did receive many submissions, we'll just show a few to feature urban and rural uh, perspectives along with online and in-person formats. <clears throat> so, First step, we have a submission from Sandy Hill Community Health Center on their exercise groups. Um, and this inspirational and meaningful moment was submitted by Emily Clark. So Sandy Hill CHC pivoted from offering in-person unilingual exercise groups targeting older adults to offering online bilingual exercise groups. They also offered a few English and French tutorial sessions last spring on how to use Zoom in order to get their participants familiar and ready for the program. This year, they offered 10 different exercise groups and, and have had over 30 participants join at one time, with many being in the 70 to 90 age range category. They managed to offer these groups due to dedicated, enthusiastic staff members, intern students from the University of Ottawa, and of course, their participants. Many of them have expressed how they can now communicate with family members using Zoom and how these groups have helped tremendously with their physical, mental, and social well-being during these trying times. Hi everyone, I'm Linda and I'm from the Seaway Valley Community Health Center. We're located in Cornwall. And today I'd like to present to you Connect Well with Community Health, Renfrew County Sites that was uh, submitted by Laura Miley, a program called Fun, Fit and Fully Alive. So this program was a group uh, fitness class for older adults. 
and they partnered with Cyber Seniors to deliver customized training for the fitness class participants. Uh, the, these classes were led by certified senior fitness instructor volunteers who had learned the complex process of managing technology and leading the class. Volunteers have taken the lead throughout and learned to adapt their fitness class design for an online platform. From these virtual classes uh, have evolved other virtual social programs, such as the monthly coffee club, uh, led exclusively by their volunteers. So here you can see is a great screenshot of participants uh, enjoying this uh, fun, fit and fully alive class. So I also submitted on behalf of the Seaway Valley Community Health Centre a new program that we initiate, initiated this winter called Making Tracks. Uh, when everything was uh, shut down from going indoors, we decided to take uh, something outdoors, uh, which we were able to do this winter. Uh, so what we did was we partnered with Centre de Santé uh, to organize an outdoor snowshoeing activity along the Summerstown trails. This was a great opportunity for people to, who are having Zoom fatigue to get outside and enjoy an outdoor activity. So the participants were able to safely enjoy this activity uh, while staying active and connecting with others. Uh, we were also very fortunate that the volunteers who work at the Summertown Trails led the groups through the various trails. Uh, they made it even more interesting by explaining the history of the property and the wildlife that thrive there. So it was very interesting indeed and very interactive. So this is just a little picture of two of our volunteers who are responsible for screening our uh, participants. And then of course, everyone heading off onto the trails, which we did each time. Um, yeah, so it was a great activity and lots of fun. So next highlight is from Centertown CHC, and there's actually two. So Cards Against Isolation and Friendly Callers, and this was submitted by Natasha Baudet. So uh, these uh, two programs were started to tackle loneliness in the high density downtown Ottawa area where many folks live alone. Um, so Cards Against Isolation connects neighbors to reach out and break the isolation in a safe way by sending cards. The community members can sign up to send and or receive a card uh, and they're also uh, provided with the cards or they can um, use their own if they prefer. They can send them anonymously or they can personalize a message with their first name. And so sometimes supportive pen pal relationships would develop between the participants. About 75 to 100 cards were sent out in December, February, and April. And then the second program was the Friendly Callers, where volunteers were trained to provide uh, calls to individuals who would like someone to chat with. Each volunteer calls or emails one to five individuals. And then in addition, the Friendly Caller volunteers meet every second month to share how the experience is going. So here we have just an example of some of the cards. Um, again, it's from Centertown, so it was uh, location specific, but you can see just some prompts that were provided to folks if they were to be provided the cards. So, dear neighbor, one thing I love about living downtown blank. Uh, I keep my spirits up by doing blank. Uh, one thing I'm doing for my health right now, uh, from your neighbor, first name only, if they wanted to provide their first name. Uh, so this was a submission by Kingston Community Health Center in, uh, to respond to food insecurity, uh, and it was submitted by Christine Bell. Uh, so this is a, a community collaboration uh, with a partnership through the United Way to address food insecurity. Uh, seniors food boxes had increased to 400 box per month thanks to this program after March 2020. The good food box went online with two thirds of over 400 boxes being subsidized. <clears throat> volunteers packed and delivered the food boxes to the community members and volunteers would call the day before the boxes were to be delivered, which also served as a social connection. School snacks were delivered to families every Friday and daily evening meals were served outside of KCHC by Lionheart volunteers and staff. 500 masks were sewn by volunteers and were included in the senior food boxes. 800 cards of against isolation were included in the December boxes and 400 of the cards included artwork from elementary school children. We also wanted to provide everyone just some of the additional submissions that we received. So uh, we have from Wabano Healthy Sexuality Program uh, and a culture camp, which was in person for three consecutive weekends. Carlington CHC submitted um, 
their winter carnival pro, uh, event uh, that happened every February. Uh, South Nepean Satellite of Pinecrest Queensway CHC, their whole plethora of virtual programs. Uh, they had so many that we condensed it into the into the bullet form, but still worth very much worth celebrating all of their uh, very interesting programs that they had. So congratulations to everyone on their creativity, resilience, and collaboration. And of course, their hard work that has meant so much and, and really has kept uh, the connection going throughout the pandemic. And next, we, <laughs> we have the virtual trivia night, which is a deep dive into uh, just one of the examples that we have for uh, pivoting during the pandemic. And this is a program from uh, my center, Carlington Community Health Center, uh, that my colleagues and I run every month. So we're going to do, it's a little bit more interactive, so get ready to participate. Um, I apologize if you're eating. <laughs> So here we have just an overview of exactly what the virtual trivia night is. So it's to provide a safe and engaging activity for learning about health related issues, specifically COVID-19 and vaccines. Originally, we were thinking about uh, creating different topics every month, but with the changing uh, nature of COVID and the vaccines, we kept it going every month for the same theme. Uh, we had about average 24 participants per event per month. And of course, it was to provide um, community resources and the information, uh, promote physical and mental wealth, uh, health and well-being, and build that sense of community and connect with neighbors that uh, was sometimes more difficult throughout all the lockdowns. Uh, we use polling and Zoom, which we're now pretty familiar with at this point, but back then it wasn't as popular. Uh, clear and informative trivia questions for two thirds of the hour, and then that remained ample time for a Q&A. We had a guest participant from Ottawa Public Health specializing in the topic for the Q&A. Uh, we also had registration required to track participants, but also provide the participants with the contact information, such as myself, when they registered. Uh, and then a staff support person for last minute registration and monitoring the chat was always available. And of course, uh, it was monthly, but uh, we always made sure that we updated the morning of uh, to make sure that it was the most up-to-date information because sometimes it would change within the hour. So first question, I'll just read it out and I'll explain how this trivia works. <laughs> I'll read out the question and then you'll receive the pop-up poll and you do your best, you'll be receiving, uh, getting about 15 minutes to do your best guess. I, of course it's anonymous. Um, and then we'll show the answer after and you might know the answer, you might not. So the first question is, about vaccines and how that works. And so we're trying to debunk some of the myths and, the, and provide very um, accurate information in this section. So how does the vaccine work? It uses a live virus that causes COVID-19. It sends instructions to cells to make spike proteins, affects and interacts with their DNA, causes the COVID-19 infection or all of the above. So you should see the poll, there it is. <laughs> And so you'll notice single choice. So sometimes uh, some of the questions were a multiple choice, so you could click more than one. Uh, for example, one that we, I won't show here today, but um, what are some of the common symptoms of COVID-19 was a question in the past. Um, what are the potential side effects with the vaccine as well, but also coinciding with showing just how common some of those side effects are as well. Uh, was always important to include. So we'll close the poll. If you didn't have a chance, that's okay. There'll be more opportunities. So the answer is drum roll. <laughs> Anticipation, there you go. <laughs> so the answer is it sends instructions to cells to make the spike proteins. So of course, here we go a little bit into the MRNA, um, and how the immune system is activated. But if we can move on to the next slide, because I wanted to demonstrate that it wasn't just about showing the correct answer, we wanted to provide information on why the other answers were uh, incorrect. So for example, why is the answer that uh, uses a live virus that causes COVID-19, why is that false? And you can see here, uh, speaking a little bit to the, um, the live versus non-live um, virus. And then the next slide will be um, kind of going through the other ones that so causes the COVID-19 infection. Um, and then the last slide in this section was the, 
going too fast here. If that's an interacts with your DNA. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll go on to the next question. And you can you might be able to tell it looks a little different because it's evolved through the, throughout the month. So at the beginning, it was very uh, straightforward just with the polling. And now we actually have graphics and animations uh, moving around the screen uh, as well as sound. So how can you book an appointment um, for your COVID-19 vaccine? And this is a multiple choice. So online at Province of Ontario website, you can call the booking line and there's a phone number. You can just walk in or call 311. So you can do your best. Yeah. And we'll launch the poll. And so this one is, this one, uh, for this poll question, it is a single choice. So you will only be able to click one, but if you have more than one idea in mind, keep it in the back, you might be right. <laughs> All right, so we'll close it down. Now, sometimes I would leave it up a little bit longer for participants. So here we go. So a majority of folks put on that you can do it on the Ontario website. And this, this is an interesting one because back uh, before, uh, well, we'll go on to the next day. I'll go to the next uh, slide just to show the answer here. So the answer is, of course, definitely on the website, you can call the booking line or you can just walk in. And at the time of making the slide originally, just walk in wasn't an option, but now it is. And so we'll go to the last question here. So this one's a little bit different because it's not, it's not specific to um, providing information and resources and uh, about COVID or the vaccines. It's a little bit more fun. Some of the feedback I got was a little stale. <laughs> It's not, it's not as trivia uh, is supposed to be fun. So um, which of the following social media platforms saw the biggest increase in visits in 2020 during the pandemic? So we've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. And this is a single choice, of course. So we'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, I'm gonna close it down. All right, 75% of folks have said TikTok. That's interesting. Okay, so the answer is TikTok. That is correct. So of course you can see here um, that Facebook has seen the most visits, but the most increase was for TikTok. And I think that's indicative of exactly what we're all looking for. We're so, so overwhelmed with information uh, throughout the pandemic and sometimes taking that quick little break uh, for that 20 second video of somebody dancing is, uh, is very great to break up the day a little bit. And so I always, we always ended the trivia evening with uh, this slide and it never changed. So we provide all of the links um, all of the links and all the phone numbers, all the information into the chat. Again, I had my amazing team working alongside me to, to navigate this whole trivia. So uh, we would have the hyper, the links into the chat, phone numbers, um, some key resources there. Um, so you might've seen there's kind of three themes with the questions. We have uh, information and questions on uh, COVID-19 in itself. We have questions about the vaccine and then a fun question. And so we try to cover all of our bases with that, with the outline of the trivia. But in a nutshell, that is our snapshot preview of what uh, an hour of trivia would look like in five, 10 minutes. Thank you. And I will pass it off to Catherine. Thank you so much um, to all of you, Hillary, Jacob, Linda, and Natasha for uh, your wonderful presentations, uh, for giving us a, a bit of a taste of what health promotion is and what health promotion has looked like during the pandemic. Uh, so we're gonna move on now to um, an informal panel discussion um, about really um, how health promotion can help uh, your organization uh, move the needle on their pop on its population health goals. Uh, so again, our panelists are Natasha from Centertown, Hillary Rose from Carlington, uh, 
Linda from Seaway Valley, Jacob from Wabano, and uh, Cameron from Carlington. We do have some questions that people submitted during the registration process, so we will kind of get started with those, uh, but then we will um, uh, move along to uh, questions that have come up uh, in your minds during uh, the presentation. So please do, um, if you have those burning questions, uh, please do type them into the chat and we'll uh, hopefully be able to uh, get to everyone because we've got about uh, almost 40 minutes. So um, I'm going to stop screen sharing it now. And I'm going to uh, spotlight uh, our panelists and uh, then we will get to the questions. So uh, thanks for your patience, everybody, as we just work through this process. And it looks like Susan was able to join us. So um, welcome, Susan. And uh, surprise, I'm going to put a spotlight on you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Huh. I may only be able to put four spotlights on. That's a shame. Okay, um, I've got Jacob, Linda, Natasha, and uh, Cam on right now, um, but uh, Susan and uh, Hillary, you're not off the hook. I'm going to dynamically <laughs> try and, and switch it up so everybody gets to see a, a variety of faces uh, during uh, this panel. Uh, so I'm just going to pull up those questions that came in. Um, the first one uh, is, so uh, there were several questions actually as people are thinking um, about uh, virtual care, people are thinking about post pandemic future um, and so on. Uh, we're gonna start with one specifically about a post pandemic future. And if any of you on the panel can share examples of population health issues um, that you anticipate will emerge during the post pandemic uh, period and larger projects that we might undertake uh, to address needs that will likely emerge or increase um, as a result of the changing population health needs. Can I take a first stab? Uh, I'm Cam McLeod from Carlington Community Health Center. Thanks to the panelists uh, for your presentations, really good stuff. And clearly um, the pandemic has created an environment where we have to really think not only in the moment, but going forward and what this is all gonna mean. Um, we were, I'm going to brag a little bit, we were really smart at Carlington because at the beginning of the pandemic when we saw it coming, we anticipated the need to move to virtual care and we went out and bought a whack of uh, computers and were able to in a very quick time once it hit get people set up at home and working remotely. Um, you know, we made a decision, we said, well, can we afford this and we said up. Absolutely not. And then we said, can we afford not to? And we said, absolutely not. So like a lot of centers, um, we, you know, took the plunge and made that investment. Uh, what I learned and what I was worried about, um, and our health promoters, I think, would share this, is that I was worried that our clients, just because of the natures of the clients and their capacity around uh, access to um, the technology they would need to receive virtual care, I was worried that they wouldn't be able to. And thankfully, I was wrong. Uh, in fact, we really learned about the innovation and the resilience of our clients because at Carlington, one of the things our board tracks is our no-show rates and our cancellation rates. And we had a glass floor at 7%. I've been here eight years. So for six and a half of eight years, we were at 7% no-shows. Once we introduced virtual care, we actually eliminated the barrier of access around getting on a bus in a pandemic and coming in the winter with three kids to a um, you know, primary care appointment. And our, um, our no-show rates fell from 7% to 1%. So ultimately, I've been, calling this, um, I've been calling this accelerated evolution because I really believe we're at a place we would have eventually gotten to 
Um, but we weren't able in this case to say we can't afford it. It's stupid. We don't have the policies. What about privacy? And we all just sucked it up and did it and said, damn the torpedoes. So I think looking ahead, virtual care is here to stay. So the challenge for organizations is what portion of our appointments are going to be virtual? Who really needs to come into the office? How do we do now virtual outreach? Do we set up stations, for example, in some of our social housing buildings where somebody can come and knock on the door and have a virtual appointment for counseling? health promotion, chronic disease management, primary care, um, and what does that all look like? So certainly at Carlington, we are trying to answer those questions and anticipate what's coming. And it's going to have health promotion and community development implications too, because I'm talking a lot, but I'll stop. We really have to think about, um, you know, how are we now engaging with communities? What about isolation? Um, who is going to benefit from an in-person appointment and then emerging from the pandemic, what's it going to be around masking and access and, you know, vaccinations and all that kind of stuff that we've now um, gotten right squarely on our radar. So I'll stop talking and turn it over to the experts. Thank you. Well, I, I'll step in and I can say one thing that we're seeing as a result of like lockdowns and people feeling nervous about leaving their apartments is we're seeing, um, you know, people have been locked in for a long time. And so when people do come out for our groups, whether it's on Zoom or in person, we, we've started some outdoor in person and we're slowly shifting back to some in person groups, people have lost a lot of their social skills. They've also lost, like I see clients who used to be able to walk to the grocery store can know they've, they've gotten out of the habit of walking or some of these like healthy habits. So for me, that's what I think we'll be seeing is kind of like trying to help get our clients back to where they were 19 months ago in terms of their health activities and their ability to socialize and connect with others. From a um, like health promotion and fitness perspective of what I've experienced and noticed, um, we were able to adapt successfully to all of our fitness programming to be virtual uh, during the be close to the halfway mark of the pandemic. And um, we've seen some steady numbers and participation and engagement throughout the course of this year and a half. And um, one of the things I've noticed, though, um, from clients and in, in, in feedback and surveys is that they really do miss um, being connected physically um, in those fitness programs in person. And, um, you know, mental health has definitely um, been something that we should definitely take into account for as, as organizations and, and health representatives and promoters in the community is that there needs to be um, a lot more accessibility and access to mental wellness and services you know, and I think because the time that we live in, and like, you know, Natasha and Cam, you said, you know, being, being isolated and, and um, alone and not being able to leave your house in certain ways or even certain services um, and, and virtual appointments is great. I think it's excellent, um, but I'm hoping in a post pandemic world, we can go back safely um, into in-person programming um, and having access to mental wellness services in person um, where they're in their one-on-ones, uh, you know, in, in safe setting and, um, I think it will not only help um, down the road, but yeah, I believe that it will definitely create a lot more boost in our mental wellness uh, support for our communities. I agree, Jacob. I feel that our seniors were one of the most impacted groups, uh, being socially isolated, sometimes in homes where they were isolated in their rooms for weeks and months at a time. Uh, so we're really pleased this summer to be able to offer an outdoor program. It was called Seniors on Wheels. And uh, we were able to do that in partnership with the city of Cornwall. And uh, we had like a little pedicab that we were able to bring seniors out to the park and drive them around. So we hope that we'll be continuing on and forward so that we can offer those um, programs to people so they feel less isolated and more in tune and connected with others. So we also try to make it intergenerational so they were connecting with younger people as not only just seniors to seniors. So I hope that post pandemic we can continue on with those types of programming and be bring people outdoors and together once again. I'm going to move along just because we have quite a few questions to get started. Um, and some of the questions I have, I think are, you know, they're, they're very much um, overlapping with that one. So um, the, 
there's a, several questions about how that balance of online and in-person programming is going to shift um, and how permanently the shift is going to be and so on. So um, I guess, do you have programs that went online that you plan to keep offering online? Um, and the ones that you're bringing back to in-person, how have you modified them to be more COVID safe? And do you see any you know, of these shifts being sort of permanent even you know, after the pandemic is over? Um, I guess I can speak to a part of it. Um, so for virtual programming, um, our experience has been so similar to what Cam and Natasha were talking about. Um, my catchment, which is a South Nepean satellite of PQ, we cover a large suburban and rural area. And transportation and all kinds of travel challenges have always been a part of our community outreach and engagement. And I just found the virtual programs were much appreciated by seniors and also newcomer women who've been really uh, making good use of all the virtual programs. And um, the big feedback I'm getting from them through evaluations is that please keep the virtual programs on. And so there is a lot of pressure to continue a hybrid model. And I'm not sure what that will look like. Um, I can see the school, my, my kids, the school teachers have been doing an amazing job, you know, running synchronous sessions and stuff like that. I'm not sure, um, you know, how exactly I can run an in-person and a virtual group at the same time, but I think that's definitely going to be a part of our work. I just wanted to add um, that it is youth engagement has been really hard during COVID. So whereas uh, newcomer women and um, seniors engagement went up through virtual programming, it's kind of youth engagement has gone down a, a lot. It's been very hard to do that. So that has been our experience. Um, I know some of my colleagues here have actually done more in-person programming than I have. So I'll just hand that over to someone else. Um, speaking of the, the shift from in-person to virtual and also creating some sort of hybrid, um, I think from in my experience, the largest program that saw the biggest challenge was our income tax uh, clinic. And so, and with the nature of the, like the, the privacy confidentiality, but still obtaining consent and signatures and everything, uh, having it completely online wasn't necessarily an option for the majority of our clients and our, our folks in our community. So creating a hybrid um, was very necessary in the sense that we could still obtain the information, still maintain that trust with our clients, uh, but also effectively run the program at the same time and so before it was only in-person face-to-face appointments where the client would come with them to the volunteer and they would file the taxes but now um, the interaction between the volunteer and the client is completely virtual or over the phone and I do just a small snippet of that in person um, but so you can still it depends on the program but it's it, either way it's necessary and then another example of that hybrid would be with um, our FIT program, which is for older adults, and it's informative, it includes a little bit of information, a little bit of fitness, and of course, a tea time, social time. And so by nature of having it in that hybrid where you have that laptop open and with the camera pointing to the group, folks who don't can't or don't want to come out in person for whatever reason can still participate. And then the folks who need and would desire that in-person interaction can still do that. And you're reducing the gathering size that way too. So I think it depends on the program and it depends on the initiative, but really kind of thinking outside the box and how we can create that hybrid to make it accessible for everyone and what they'd like is important to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, and so I think that you've kind of answered the, the next couple of questions, which was what challenges you've experienced and how you've tackled them. Um, but what would you say are the most successful strategies that you've employed in adapting to virtual health promotion? 
I can maybe share an anecdote. So I definitely had clients who said at the beginning of the pandemic, like, I will never join your Zoom group. I don't like computers. I will never join. Like, okay. And then I would call them back like six months later. No, I'm not interested. And then like after a year went by, they're like, okay, I'm ready for something, you know? So there was like a, it was kind of like keep working with the clients and we were able to get funding to provide tablets and laptops and we worked with connected Canadians to get some training so that to me has been like kind of a big success is people who have never thought they would ever be able to use computers or are now like zooming in and use it. and they're also using their computers to like have email and connect to the internet so that to me was like and it was it was our our staff like just chipping away and just following up are you sure like and just kind of gently getting people into um some technology so that's been kind of a success I think and now that they're in that world it's opened up a whole other world of possibility for them the only challenge I found with some people in the rural communities is access to the internet so not everybody has that so that's just something to consider as well post pandemic or how we can get that uh, out to them so I know that there's some areas where you can go and park at a hospital or Tim Hortons and get free wi-fi but that's not always ideal when they want to join in on uh, virtual programming so I thought I would share one successful strategy, um, and this might be something a lot of people here ha have been doing, is to combine your virtual session with some individual, like connect, like supplies drop off, or you know something like that. So if it's a cooking program or a painting program, we drop off supplies to each person and then you know then we all join together on zoom i think uh many of us have done that successfully those are some great examples thank you um and i just want to take this opportunity to plug digital health um digital equity week uh which is actually the uh, second week of first week of October. Uh, so that would be next week. Um, and that is in conjunction with Community Health and Wellbeing Week. Uh, so Community Health and Wellbeing Week is an alliance, uh, an annual uh, program we do. Um, but the Digital Health, uh, digital Equity Week is bigger than the alliance. And uh, so we're kind of combining those this year. So there, if you um, watch the alliance website and our social media, you can actually see some events there. And hopefully, um, with that, some ideas of how you can advance digital equity and help advance access, um, as well as join advocacy for better access uh, to the internet and to devices for people who currently um, experience barriers there. Um, you all have mentioned mental health, and I'm wondering if you can share some examples of health promotion that specifically targets mental health, and also how you plan to support mental health um, through another possible pandemic winter because you know we're all going to be stuck inside a lot more well i guess i'll start with that one off uh, so i think cards against isolation i know it's a program that um, may not seem like it uh, impacts mental health, but I feel like it does. We sent out over 300 cards to isolated individuals and they we had tremendous feedback at how special it made them feel, uh, made them feel less forgotten and much more included. So I think that type of programming is very um, valuable to consider. From uh, Indigenous um, Health Promotions perspective here at Wabano, um, we were successful on um, like due to the pandemic and clients not being able to come see us, we were had to find a way to create strategies on providing services to our clients and going to them. Um, and through virtual programming and through different types of mental wellness um, check-ins, we would have clients um, deliver resources. We would have clients deliver um, diabetes um, resources to our diabetes clients in the community. We would have our youth team deliver um, medicine, indigenous um, for seeker medicines and berries of different types of youth workshop kits um, that they can create at home, food food prep workshops. Um, so that way they, they can stay connected um, and stay connected with their culture, which also boosts their mental, their mental health. And um, we found that um, we're still continually doing that and 
the participation and the engagement definitely is, is very supportive. And one of the feedbacks we've, a lot of the feedback I should say that we've been receiving from our clients and community is that they, they appreciate so much that we're going to them. We're making them feel continually belonged, that they're connected with us and that we haven't forgotten uh, our community from all the way from our children and youth to our young adults and to our, our seniors and elders. So, you know, finding ways to be um, strategic and delivering those resources and bringing that mental wellness and that health promotion um, to them rather than expecting them to come to us is a way of how we need to start uh, changing our approach and providing that service. Um, if I could add to what Jacob said, um, we found that our yoga and Tai Chi programs have been very, very popular and very well attended right through the year. Um, and I think that combination of um, mental wellness and physical wellness has been really helpful. And folks say that, you know, having it every day if possible is great. So we collaborating with our other partners so that we offer it at different times in different programs. So people have a chance to, you know, be on a, on a virtual group of that kind, maybe thrice a week or, you know, more if possible. Just add, we we just increased all of our stress reduction programming once the pandemic started and we've kind of kept that going. And then the other thing I see is that those Zoom groups create community. So whether it's the mindfulness group or the stop smoking support or the creative writing group, like it forms a connection and then people look forward to seeing each other every week. They, they get to know people in their group. And people tell me, okay, it gave, like, I love these Zoom meetings. It gives me a schedule. It gives me a reason to get up and get dressed and take a shower. I have somewhere to be like, like those kinds of things you can't undervalue their, the benefit for people's mental health is like having a schedule, having a place to be and being somewhere where you know people and you feel safe and welcome. I think that also really supports mental health. wanted to add one more point regarding virtual programming, especially for youth. Um, I wanted to touch base on Cam's comment there. Um, we have, um, one of the things we recognize is that working in a lot of our virtual programming for youth and because they were in school and doing a lot of virtual learning and it, the, that, that virtual fatigue really kicks in earlier in the day. They're constantly on, on this blue light. Um, so what we found really worked is, and especially in our in our longer uh, like two, we have a lot of our um, youth programs that are virtual are minimum two hours per se. Um, it's important to have breaks. It's important to step away, whether it's a halfway mark, and maybe even do like a little fitness activity, kind of get the body moving, a few jumping jacks, a few squats, you know, just have some fun with the youth, get them to moving their arms, or say, hey, turn off the screen you know, go get some water, go get a snack, you know, give your mom a hug, come back, like things like that, you know, so they're gonna, so they get those breaks. Um, I was actually doing like, uh, some, some research and it. I found something fascinating that, um, after about 30 minutes of computer work, it only takes about five minutes of our brains to actually reset and reboost our energy to go back onto working on our computers. So just even a small, small break is fine. Um, I just wanted to add that when it comes to virtual programming. Um, and you can incorporate that same um, format for seniors as well who might be struggling with the virtual fatigue as well. I think one of the things that we noticed, we have a, a shelter in our catchment area. And one of the things, the interesting thing about this pandemic is we didn't learn a lot about things that we didn't already know, right? Um, we knew that shelters were, you know, were people in shelters were struggling. We knew all of that stuff. And the pandemic really opened that crack to a chasm. And one of the things that we did as a center is we'd actually did intentional outreach to those shelters and said, look, we're going to bring you food. But with the food, we're going to bring you some information. We're going to bring you uh, a friendly face. We're going to ask you, hey, what else can we do for you? So there were opportunities on the health promotion side to address things that um, would otherwise not have been addressed. And also, um, you know, to the, to the youth piece, you, they were living in a hotel um, shelter um, and really all they had, frankly, was a microwave and a bar fridge. So 
it became really critical critical to get those uh, food security services and all of that kind of stuff in there. But on the other hand, we were able to make those connections with partners. And that's the really important piece. Nobody did that to this themselves. Get the partners in there to try and, um, I don't like the term divide and conquer, but certainly divide up the work so that we weren't all, um, we weren't, we were all rowing in the same direction, but we weren't working at cross purposes because we all wanted to help, but we were crushing each other at the door. Um, and so, coordination of those services became really important. And I think on a going forward basis, we're going to need to think about how we address those things in the pandemic context and make sure that we don't forget about it as we're moving forward. So a little bit garbled, but the important message I think here is that we have to really pay attention to the disproportionately impacted people and not say the pandemic is over, we can forget about it and go back to the way we used to do things because clearly that wasn't working. Thank you. I just want to um, uh, look at the into the chat for a moment and draw everybody's attention in case uh, you haven't uh, been able to watch the chat. Um, Claudiana uh, mentions that Unison Health and Community Services Urban Health Team has been providing mental health support through daily check-in calls to their clients, um, specifically prenatal and postnatal clients and seniors, as well as uh, outdoor digital li literacy uh, sessions, delivered food at their homes, provided laptops and iPads to clients, provided online weekly sessions with different guest speakers, including health promoters, RNs, uh, social workers, I'm sorry, I don't know TPL, and fitness instructors and more. So um, that's excellent and great to hear. So more great examples of how um, this work is, you know, adapted to address mental health and be pandemic friendly at the same time. Um, I, I'm wondering, because I know um, health equity is such a central part of what health promoters do and what health promotion is about. Um, and Jacob, thank you for sharing a bit about mental health programs um, designed, uh, um, you know, for uh, it with and for Indigenous communities. But I'm wondering if we can hear more about uh, some examples of health promotion uh, for uh, Indigenous communities, um, as well as Black, African, racialized and religious minority groups. Um, and would be love to hear some examples of sort of co-design or community engagement in the design of some of those programs. For sure. Um, well, here at Wabano, when it comes to uh, delivering um, health promotion activities, we strive to incorporate Indigenous culture in every program. So whether it's using Indigenous words and, and, and um, communicating in a safe cultural space for our clients, understanding the issues of colonization and what it has done to our, our children and our families and generations. And so knowing when you're going into a program, how to communicate to our clients, um, incorporating Indigenous foods in, in youth kitchens and in, in community kitchens um, via virtual and incorporating that and doing those teachings. Um, having elders and knowledge keepers involved with programming is super vital and important um, because they have the experience, they have the wisdom and knowledge and they share those teachings to our community members. So having them jump on to let's say fitness programming or a um, healthy sexuality program um, and allowing clients to connect um, not only through a community service connection but more on a cultural, spiritual, physical and mental connection um, it creates a better way of uh, that approach and creating balance. Um, and I find since I've been here for a few years now, while I've been working in this incredible organization and supporting our indigenous community, um, incorporating culture in every piece of our health service is really how our clients benefit. Um, we, we do that in that two-way approach. Here are a few examples from center towns. So we have some very population specific groups like our LGBTQ newcomer groups. So folks who are coming to Canada as refugees um, often. Um, so that's a very popular and specific kind of population group. We also have our, we have groups that are BIPOC exclusive. So BIPOC uh, creativity and care. And we have a creative writing group um, in order to create safe spaces where people uh, can come together and, and share. Um, we also had a four part series and this was in partnership with the coalition of CHPs in Ottawa where we had a saying no to anti Asian racism uh, series four Saturdays in a row and I believe uh, other partners in Ottawa so like really 
naming racism as a determinant of health and then creating safe spaces and working against racism. I think we have to put ourselves, um, we have to put that, put ourselves in that to, to, to demonstrate how valuable our clients are to us and that these issues are really important. Um, our center, um, at least our health promotion programs in South Nibian, um, you know, we've been working with newcomers in collaboration with the Nibian Rito Oscar Resource Center. And I think um, uh, the first thing we did was check in with the newcomer women, um, many of whom were part of the refugee uh, resettlement in 2016 to 17. And um, it's just to ask them what they are looking for and they requested, like they used to have one group a week and they requested for up to three per week. We thought they'd be busy, you know, having more kids at home. Um, at that time, there was no in-person schooling, um, but they requested for more groups actually because it actually carved out some space for them um, instead of doing 24 hour like childcare and looking after their homes. Um, so that's what we did. And we've just followed that right through by checking in with them um, what they would like to see happening and then following through. Um, yeah. And also with our multicultural seniors groups, my colleague at Pancras Queensway also does um, lots of group programming virtually for multicultural seniors. And we've just been, um, you know, um, the, the groups based on self-determination and, you know, what kinds of topics they identify, we follow through. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, a few people, um, a few of you have mentioned uh, partnerships with um, external organizations um, as, you know, sort of key to what you do. And I wonder if, if any of you want to shed a, a bit more light on um, how you, your work reaches beyond uh, your, your clients and really supports the health of your communities and the populations within the broader community. Um, actually, I'm pretty proud of the work that we've done here at the center when we partnered with, um, to, as you know, the evacuees from Deer Lake so were brought into, we had 500 from um, brought into NAF Canada. So the Seaway Valley was very instrumental in helping them get settled into the center. I was screening them and uh, also helping them with their vaccinations if they needed to get that done as well. So um, I just think that's a great uh, significant significant partnership that we had and we we're really proud of the work that we did we literally pulled all-nighters because some of the planes were coming in in the middle of the night so we all pulled all-nighters at uh, NAVCAN to ensure that everybody was welcomed safely into NAV Canada and um, that was, I was part of that and I really enjoyed it and was very proud to be part of that uh, families were separated so it was really nice to see that we had strollers for families coming in with kids we thought of everything from coloring books to um, moms coming in first with their families and then husbands coming in later so it was quite a, an impactful uh, program to be a part of so that was a great partnership I'm going to build on that too. It, it, I, we don't work alone when we're doing these initiatives and the more the merrier almost when you're looking to maximize that point of contact with a group or with individuals. So, um, you know, with, for example, an outdoor event that we had just over the summer, we provided uh, back to school kits with knapsack school supplies from Boys and Girls Club of Ottawa and Mothercraft. We worked with the city councillor to um, organize the, not just the promotions, but the movie night, the, the sound system and everything he was present to. Uh, Ottawa Community Housing, uh, we had even other uh, organizations uh, like the CLD group, for example, contribute. Uh, we had the food for in food insecurity. So a whole, uh, our community association that we partnered with provided food and volunteers and cooking and um, we received, uh, loaned a, um, a barbecue as well to make it all happen. So we all work together to make this very large, um, project move forward. Um, and that way you're, you're again, entering in at different points. Um, you've got different perspectives coming in as well. Uh, 
Um, if I could also add in, um, partnerships have been really important, um, even for our COVID work. Like we, I think everyone from Ottawa knows, uh, we work closely with Ottawa Public Health, who've been trying their best to uh, keep um, us in the loop. Um, they have a separate team called the Community Engagement Team, and we've all, you know, linked with uh, one or two of the team members from that group. And um, yeah, so we've been rolling along, but uh, another thing we've been trying to do for residents is uh, to break down those barriers between services and between programs. Even like my parent organization, Pine Cross Queensway and us, um, South Nepean, we have two different catchments and with very different range of needs and populations. Um, but we realize that one common thing we have is, um, you know, the newcomers and seniors groups. So we very intentionally try to break down that barrier between our two um, um, catchments and kinds of programming. And we even try to have um, collaborations between the two. And now I'm getting a lot of feedback from seniors saying this has been great because I can attend everything. I have more options, more timings. Um, and overall, those who've been attending those have stayed in better state of well-being throughout the pandemic. So it's been a rewarding experience. I'll just add really quickly in Ottawa, um, I think Natasha already mentioned, we actually have a coalition of community health and resource centers. So there's 13 of us that basically go coast to coast to coast in Ottawa. Um, and we're, you know, we're a substantial uh, force in terms of uh, community and social service delivery, health promotion, community development, and we work together. So as the executive leaders group, we do all meet together. We have six community health centers and seven community resource centers. And the only distinction really is the CHCs have primary care. Um, but what we try to do as a coalition is influence policy decisions. We help try to help make the city, help the city make good budget decisions around uh, vulnerable populations. So that partnership is, is crystallized at that coalition and we're seen as a, an influencer certainly in the community and, and we really advocate strongly for the whole service system to have further investments in social infrastructure. So we really see what we used to call the social safety net as getting tears in it and we wanna shore that up and actually increase funding because we really feel that um, that has, we have suffered as a sector uh, when we see police budgets and I'm getting a little editorial here, but police budgets and other budgets going up and we've re remained flat at best. Um, so that's, that's a really important partnership. The other piece I will add is the CHCs in Ottawa, up until a year ago, we were in actually a joint strategic plan. We got together and said, look, we can be stronger if we get together and have um, a distinct direction that we're going. So we came up with the three pillars of of access and quality and leveraging our collective strengths to the benefit of the community and making sure everyone in our community um, was, was benefiting from health equity. Where that landed us, frankly, one of our pillars was leveraging our collective strengths and we actually got together and convened an Ontario health team with a community focus rather than waiting for hospitals to kick in. We said, no, if, we, if the hospital kicks in here, there's a risk that, I hope there's no hospitals on here, but there's a risk that we're gonna lose that community impact and the community influence on social services direction and primary care. So that's something that we did as a sector and so far, knock on wood, so good. We're approved and it's been a really successful journey in bringing the community together and creating partnerships that didn't exist before. Quickly on the mental health front, if you, if you Google Counseling Connect, you'll see something that's really come out of the pandemic where people can now get uh, instant access to a booking for or um, counseling services, short-term counseling, which were impacted because people couldn't do walk-in during the pandemic. So anyway, I'll stop again. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, it is 1.30. Uh, so being mindful of people's time, I think we will wrap there. Uh, but I really appreciate all of you. Um, so I want to thank uh, every single one of our panelists and presenters, Jacob, Linda, Natasha, Cam, Susan, and Hillary. You're all amazing. And I want to thank everybody um, who showed up today, um, who was able to find the time. I know people's schedules are busy, um, but you know it's, it's great to see uh, so many people. And I really appreciate everybody who came out today. And participated. So thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all uh, a wonderful uh, day today. And, um, 
and I wish you all a, an insightful day tomorrow as we all gather to uh, reflect on uh, truth and reconciliation and the legacy of residential schools in Canada. So thank you everybody and miigwech. Miigwech, thank you everyone.